No decision made to drop charge against Donald Rodney, says the PNC. CSEC results officially released a QC student tops country with 25 subjects. Vagrants are being blamed by City Hall for missing manhole covers in the city. And unfit and elderly persons should not be hired as guards, says Minister Keith Scott. But those were the top headlines for the week ending August 25. Welcome to MTV News Updates Week in Review. I'm Ashley Scotland. Chairman of the People's National Congress Reform, Basil Williams, says he does not know whether the party will be dropping the charge against Donald Rodney. The brother of Dr. Walter Rodney was charged for the possession of the explosive which claimed the life of Dr. Rodney. Find out more in this report. Minister and Attorney General Basil Williams, who is also chairman of the People's National Congress Reform, the largest bloc in the coalition government, says he does not know whether the charge against Donald Rodney will be dropped. Donald Rodney was charged 30 years ago for possession of the explosive, which claimed the life of his brother. Well, I, I don't know. I haven't just my mind. Not as yet. However, the Working People's Alliance has been at the forefront, calling for the charge of possession of an explosive to be dropped. Executive member of the WPA, Takoma Ogunsei, said during the last meeting with the coalition parties, President David Granger tasked an individual to address various issues, which includes the charge brought against Donald Rodney. Another executive member of the Working People's Alliance, Dr. David Hines, said the party is in favor of having the charge dropped. We are requesting uh, that those charges be withdrawn and the party has mandated us to pursue that matter. Donald Rodney was charged back in 1980 for the possession of an explosive which killed his brother, Dr. Walter Rodney, on June 13. From the Commission of Inquiry into the death of the glorified leader, it was revealed that former President Forbes Burnham had knowledge of the plot to kill Dr. Rodney. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Three regions are expected to be less polluted as a comprehensive sanitary landfill site is expected to be opened in each of the regions. This will be costing the government $131 million. Acting Mayor of Linden, Monica Arendelle, said the new initiative will allow persons to take recycling to a new level. She stated the site will allow proper disposal away from open dumping, which is presently being done in Linden. Arminel claimed the Congress is also expected to start educating students on proper garbage disposal methods. It's going to benefit us in a way. It's going to take us farther than just open dumping. It's going to allow us to have separation of our garbage and types of garbage. Mayor of Bartica, Gifford Marshall, said the region is in need of such a site as residents have been made to use the Baidi Rabo dump site, which has been very costly to maintain. However, the new site, which is on the outskirts of the town, is a more convenient location, according to Marshall. Monthly basis, we spend at least a million dollars just to keep the site um, somewhat environment, um, in an environmentally friendly manner. But still, we need to move that, um, that, that dumb site to see from there as early as possible. So the 40-mile site will, of course, um, allow us to close by the rubber dump site and remove all of that waste out of the township. A solid investigation study is expected to commence this month at the three earmark sites, Karakara in Linden, Black and White in Madia, and Five Miles, Bartika. Waste profile studies will be conducted during the first phase, which will see the inclusion of design in the next eight months. Bidding will follow. Given the geographical spread of the different administrative regions, design may vary following soil investigation. However, each site is expected to hold all necessities, consistent with a comprehensive solid waste management program. The three contracts, which have been inked for a total of $131 million, are expected to last a span of 70 to 100 years. Sanitary landfill sites are used for controlled disposal of solid waste away from the environment. President David Granger says he will not prolong the matter of police promotion unnecessarily. The head of state claims that he wants everyone to be satisfied with the promotion list. Find out more in this report. President David Granger during an interview today said he is awaiting the report from the persons tasked to look into what has affected the police promotion list. The head of state affirmed that he would not be prolonging the matter unnecessarily. We are awaiting information and as soon as it's in, um, completed you'll be informed. 
But as I, I said uh, last week, I have no intention of prolonging it more longer than is necessary. But um, we have to get to the bottom of it and we want to make sure that inside the police force, people are satisfied, that the public is satisfied, and that the, the um, mission or the objective and the, of the um, Police Service Commission are also satisfied. So we're looking to satisfy the police, the public, and the commission. President Granger had said that the administration has received numerous complaints and information against police officers who are on that promotion list. President Granger told reporters the list has been placed on hold to verify the information. The head of state believes that those persons' constitutional rights are not being trampled on by the Police Service Commission. He asserted there is no intention to impede the work of the Police Service Commission from executing its mandate. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Eleven inmates from the New Opportunity Corps on the Essequibo Coast were recaptured after they absconded from the facility. The Minister of Social Protection says measures will be put in place to ensure another breakout does not reoccur. Find out more in this report. The police say on Sunday sometime after 17 hours, six females and five males escaped from the New Opportunity Corps on the naming. Police say two females were subsequently recaptured, while the remaining nine were recaptured at approximately six hours this morning. All the inmates were recaptured not far from the facility, according to the police. During an exclusive interview with Minister of Social Protection, Amna Ali, she stated that she does not have all the facts concerning the inmates who escaped from the facility. However, she was quick to acknowledge that the new Opportunity Corps was recently handed over to the Ministry from the Department of Culture, Youth and Sports. We are examining ways of way by which we can, you know, work out to properly have our the, the, the inmates of these um, institutions reintegrated into society. Minister Ali noted that steps will be taken to ensure that such an incident do not occur in the future. We are doing everything possible to ensure that the facility, um, the facilities are secured and so on. So there are things that we will have to do in order to ensure that the facilities are secure. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. The electricity woes that are currently plaguing the nation are expected to be limited or totally eradicated by the year 2025. The Power Producers and Distributors Incorporated says it will use renewable and clean energy sources to generate electricity by then. Here is Sandy Ramatar who was on that tour. In their bid to ensure transparency, the Power Producers and Distributors Incorporated took the media on a tour of three of their four power plants. This was done for media operatives to have a first-hand experience of the maintenance and operational management of the plants. According to the management team, the strategic plan will include the generation of electricity from renewable energy sources. Those envisioned are hydropower, natural gas, which is expected to emanate from the imminent oil and gas industry, and solar power. You will note that the government has a stated policy or a stated goal of producing electricity, all electricity with the grid by 2025 from renewable and clean sources of energy. In that regard, there are a number of options being considered. And the two, more, the two most significant ones at this time are hydropower and associated natural gas once the, once the field, um, the, the, the oil and gas production starts. Okay? The 136 employees of the Power Producers and Distributors Incorporated are Guyanese, with about 80% crossing over from Wartzilla. In this regard, we continue to invest in our human resources uh, by way of both in-house and uh, training that is provided by external sources. Our specific focus has been a focus that is applicable to the operations and maintenance of the power plant and to give our employees a holistic view of of what goes on in the, in, in the operation. To ensure continuous learning, the company had also provided our job training for the employees. Thus far, the company has reported no serious injuries, preventing any of its employees from performing their duties. The man who stopped dead Trevor Dublin was again remanded to prison. 
Legal advice is being sought by investigators to proceed with the charge. Find out more in this Nikhil Jondu report. Nebu Archer made his second court appearance at the Sparanda Magistrates Court. Archer was charged back in July for the murder of Trevor Dublin of Seafield Sophia, Greater Georgetown. Dublin was found dead in a pool of blood on the main access road of Seafield Sophia by a police patrol on June 25. He sustained a stab wound to his chest and according to the autopsy, which was conducted days after, Dublin died as a result of a punctured lung. The prime suspect, who made his second court appearance today, was unrepresented and told Magistrate Alicia George that he would get a lawyer at his next court hearing. The police prosecutor told the court that the police investigation is completed. However, the file has to be sent to the police legal advisor. As such, the prosecutor asks for three weeks for that process to be completed. The 31-year-old was then remanded until October 3, 2017. The deceased wife said it has been tough on her since Dublin was killed. My husband is with the breadwinner for the home. And I have nobody to assist me with my children and my last baby since a year old. And I work on bus and you know bus tax don't be no big set of money. Remember the children have to go to school, they have to eat. The school fee have to pay is on me and me alone and I don't know what more is. Well, I feel glad because my husband and deserve that debt that he having because he don't trouble nobody. Nobody at all, he don't trouble you, right? Go to work, from work, he comes straight home. Nobody don't trouble that. No, and I would like to see the person right now. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Operators in the private security sector are being urged not to employ unfit or elderly persons as they would not be able to effectively execute their jobs. Nikhil John, who has that story. Minister within the Ministry of Social Protection with responsibilities for labor, Keith Scott says there are a number of private security operators which are employing persons that are unfit or too old for the job. The minister noted that there are approximately 8,000 employees in that sector. However, most of those employees are not physically fit and are advanced in age, which limit their capability to function properly. Minister Scott believes that such practice should not be condoned and advises those providers to stop immediately. This call comes on the heels of a meeting held with private security operators this morning. We are in a position to tell you directly because they, they come to our night shelter and recruit people. So we're not just guessing, we're talking for what we are in a position to tell you with authority that there are security services who go there and recruit people. He added also that private security operators are not paying their employees on time, their stipulated wages and overtime. The government of Guyana is prepared to spend unlimited funds in defense of any Guyanese citizen. And if such a person wants to feel that he can spend unlimited money, we are prepared to go all the way to the CCJ, if necessary, to defend this one dollar for what that is due to somebody. We shall do such a thing. Minister Scott further added that those private operators should formulate a policy to have females work only during the day. The minister believes that the family structure is at a disadvantage and can be seriously affected in the long term and can lead to unwanted social ills. We have taken the effects of night work for granted and that has led to serious damage to the family and to society. The positive benefit which can flow from a prohibition of night work by women are enormous. No one will consciously deny that the pass rate in our local and regional examinations are likely to increase once women remain at home at night to supervise their children and, the, and their grandchildren in the conduct of their homework. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. British High Commissioner to Guyana Greg Quinn believes the population lacks the will to fight for the fundamental right of gender equality. People are generally stuck with the mindset of the ancient days, which they consider still to be acceptable. 
This is the expression of British High Commissioner to Guyana, Greg Quinn, at a recent media engagement. Quinn believes the onus is on Guyanese to represent for gender equality, which has seen no progress in the last two years. Now, and the reason for that is not a lack of will on the part of the government. The reason is a lack of will on the part of the population and a lack of will on the part of people in the country to address the fundamental issues which exist. Vice Chair of the Alliance for Change, Catherine Hughes, said there are a number of existing training programs with facilitators that are advocating for women leadership in all sectors. In addition to this, she said her ministry is aggressively fighting for women inclusion in information communication technology. So um, I am very strong in saying in many, many different um, fora that women have a role to play, that we want women to sit at the same table. So we have, when we talk about the development of Guyana, a women's perspective that is part of any discussion. That's very important. Equality refers to the equal rights, responsibilities and opportunities of women and men and girls and boys, according to the UN Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women. Sandy Ramudar for MTV's News Update. Vagrants are being blamed for the missing manhole covers in the city. The Supervisor City Engineers Department of City Hall claims the vagrants remove the metal covers and sell it to scrap metal dealers. During a telephone interview with Assistant Engineer Rashid Kelman, this newscast was told that a meeting was held between the City Engineers Department of City Hall and the Guyana Water Incorporated to establish strategies to properly cover the manholes in the city. According to the supervisor within the city engineer's department, Hardly King, the vagrants in the city remove the covers from the manholes and sell them to scrap metal dealers. The council then placed wooden covers over the manholes. The council, together with GWI, is trying to rectify the seemingly perpetual cycle, King stated. Well, GWI and also is an ongoing project right now to cover the, um, the, the manhole um come on in the country of GDI, right? right? We um like I said we in them right now in the process of I we we I find we are the manuals are most critical right now and they are providing us with the material and labor. Once they open once they open they, they have we have put on a permanent cover of them make out of a steel and I have the GDI mark on them. Kelman further stated that whenever there is an open manhole signs are placed to warn citizens. Kippany Jordan reporting for MTV News Update. CSAC results have been officially released by the Ministry of Education with an overall pass rate of 63.68%. The top performer gained 25 grade 1s and 1 grade 2. The Ministry of Education released the official results for the Caribbean Secondary Examination Council, which reflects a 63.68% pass rate. Minister of Education Nicholas Henry stated there is an increase of 0.46% past rate compared to last year. We have recorded improved performances in 14 subject areas, and I will call the subject areas. That would be chemistry, electronic documentation preparation and management, economics, office administration, principles of accounts, Principles of Business, Religious Education, Caribbean History, Textile, Clothing and Fashion, Family and Resource Management, Food and Nutrition and Health, Industrial Technology Building, Industrial Technology Electrical, Industrial Technology Mechanical. The top performer, Michael Bopol of Queen's College, attained 25 grade 1 and 1 grade 2. He stated that, he is satisfied with his performance and is planning to continue his studies. I feel satisfied because I put in hard work and uh, I saw the results. I feel satisfied. Well, um, you need to be consistent in your preparation. Um, you need to have your correct resources in order and you need to cooperate with your teachers because they do help you um, throughout the process. They do, they help goes a far way. So you just need, and consistency is key in preparing for this particular examination or any other examination because it makes things easier when it's time for you to deliver, to do the exams or SBAs or whatever. 
These are the joyful sentiments shared by the top seasick performers when news of date caught up with them. My name is Charles Ward Unirine, I'm from the Andrew Jain Secondary School and I would have attained 13 ones and 4 grade 2s. And how do you feel there about you? Well, it's an amazing feeling, I'm very elated at this point because to be here, as you look around, it's not much students, it's just a few and to consider the over, I think it's 12 in excess of 12,000 students that have written the CXC examination and to be lucky few out of the 12 out of the 12,000 to be here is an amazing feeling to know that all the hard work you have put in has finally paid off. Well, my name is Jeevan Dalip. I got 13 ones and one two. Well, I'm very thankful for everything I I've been blessed with and I'm very delighted that I was able to that my hard work would be able to reflect in the results of the update. 12,684 candidates registered to sit the CSEC examination 2017 compared to 12,809 for 2016. In this year's examination also, there has been a 100% pass rate in music and theater arts. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Bandits cart off with $2 million in local currency from Buddies on Sheriff Street just afternoon. The men were waiting in the parking lot of the business establishment. Find out more in this report. Police were present at the scene just afternoon today. According to Managing Director of Buddies, Ryan Shivraj, his employees withdrew a sum of cash from a city bank. However, when they returned, there was a vehicle in the parking lot. The bandits pounced on the unsuspecting employees and carted off with $2 million in local currency. Upon re to returning to the parking lot, there was a car there um, waiting on them. And they stuck up the guys, um, robbed them, and then drove away. That's pretty much um, all I know. Because I, all I heard was the gunshots, because uh, one of our security fired back at the guys. But they had already um, made a move. Um, and they made chase with them, but I don't think they caught up with them. The managing director said the crime situation is very troubling, adding that he has to take precautionary measures. It was pretty isolated, but the crime is getting so bad that you have to take so much precautions now. Um, so, I mean, that takes a toll, especially even on your security expense now, because you have to spend more money, although you're not making more money, to just make sure that you can survive in this kind of an atmosphere. The security guard, who fired shots towards the bandits, is cooperating with the police. An investigation is on the way as the police are trying to apprehend the bandits. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. 32 homes were affected by a freak storm which occurred in Jawala Region 7 on August 19. The heavy winds ripped through the buildings, causing heartache for the residents. The heavy winds and rain completely destroyed five of the 32 affected homes. This is a finding from the team that assessed the village on August 21 after the storm calmed, according to Chairman of Region 7, Gordon Bradford. The team comprised of officials from the Civil Defense Commission, Public Health Ministry, the ongoing Junior Minister of Communities, Don Hastings Williams, and a minister within the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, Valerie Garrido Lowe. So the two houses have been affected. The effects would be varying. Some were severely damaged and some were, like we can say, that minor damages and so on. According to Bradford, residents are rehabilitating their homes themselves with equipment provided to them by the RDC. In addition to this, storm relief has also been supplied to those who have been affected by the natural disaster. So, among the, the, the articles that were handed over yesterday, Mm -hmm. um, included saws, chain saws, hammer, hammers, and other equipment. And um, the region will supply fuel and lubricant. And the team also met the bereaved man who lost his pregnant wife as a result of the storm. The father is dramatized and expressed concern about his family's safety living in a said home. Residents of Dr. Charles Estate, located at Sustike East Bank de Marara, are asking for help since they are lacking the basic necessities. The residents agree that the community leader does not have their interest at heart. The residents of Dr. Charles Estate, a private community at Sustike East Bank de Marara, are once again seeking help for the community. 
The residents have been residing in the area for over six years and are lacking the basic utilities. When News of Bid paid a visit to the area, no electrical line was seen, no pipe was seen, and the roads are sand filled. One resident, Wayne McKinnon, said, For 10 years, he has been depending on flambeaux, candles, and the moonlight to see at nights. Well, we're having some difficult problems here, and we're looking for like some help from the government. We went so many places, and we didn't get no help as yet. We're facing floods, we didn't get no light, no water, and we're looking to get some real help from the government. The residents are also complaining that the overseer of the community, Patrick Dublin, is not making life easier for them. I'm very disgusting the situation because number one, we don't have no light. We have children going to school. When they come home, they can't do no homework. With the first lady, the promise we all the scheme, she couldn't get light for us, for the young, the young people to study the school work. Up to now, we have no help about this light. Also, the water. We don't have no water. The, the canal is very dirty, bushy. The IMAC and come up as yet to clean our creek. The road is in a state. I have a car and the car can't even drive in here because the road bad. We asking the government to come in and help me concerning giving me light and giving me water. Only the coming and promising me last year. They promise me they'll come and do they'll come and give me road and give me water and give me this. During a telephone interview with the community's accountant and secretary, Julian Williams, he said that the allegations the villagers are making is false since these matters have always been at the forefront. He noted, as recent as last week, a letter was sent to the Ghana Power and Light Company and Ghana Water Incorporated seeking to have their services in the community. Only recently it was followed up because they were doing some work GWI in the area and we wrote a letter to them that uh, permission to be granted to them that there is no objection of them laying pipes. And we did give them a letter um, indicating they can go ahead. We have no objection. As a matter of fact, we've been pursuing uh, utility service for these years, for years now. Reporter for MTV's News Updates, I am Yanis Abrams. Well, that's a wrap for MTV News Updates Week in Review. The newscast can be viewed online on MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us on Monday, August 28th at 6 hours 30 for another edition of MTV News Updates. On behalf of our news team, I'm Ashley Scotland, thanking you for watching.